As Adora discovered, Catra went into denial when she got sick. She had a cold, but she spent all of Thursday evening dismissing it as a mild case of the sniffles. Now it was Friday morning in bright moon, and Katra was lying in bed, grumbling that Adora didn't have to excuse her from that day's alliance meeting. It hadn't been that long since Katra had been the princess's enemy, and she was still struggling to make a good impression. Calling in sick wasn't exactly going to do that for her. I'm not sick, Adora. The fact that you called me Adora says otherwise. Katra sniffed, rolling her eyes and snuggling further under the covers. Just a sore throat, she protested, before her words turned into a fit of coughing. Shh. Stop talking, Adora said. Sit up for a second. Katra frowned. She pulled herself up into a single motion, her hair falling down from her shoulders in a mess of matted curls. Adora couldn't help but laugh. What? Nothing, you're cute. Katra huffed. That was something else she was getting used to, being close with Adora again. Adora had insisted on taking care of her instead of going to the meeting. Katra reveled in the attention, but it felt strange. Only a few months ago they'd been at each other's throats, neither of them daring to trust the other. Now they'd rekindled their friendship. And not just that, in their private moments together, Katra would lean her head on Adora's shoulder. They'd hold hands. They had even kissed. It was everything Katra had ever wanted and never let herself hope for. You are... She coughed. Ah, cute. I'm a mess. Adora rubbed her shoulders, sympathetic. No, you're not. Let me braid your hair. Katra shifted, so she had her back to Adora, who grabbed a red ribbon from the nightstand drawer. She sat down on the bed behind Katra. Can you do a fishtail? Sure. Katra smiled and reached back, catching Adora's hand as she was about to start working on the braid. She interlaced their fingers and tilted her head so she could see Adora. Thanks for staying with me. It's no problem, Adora beamed. Turn around. Katra obliged. She gave a soft sigh and closed her eyes, enjoying the feeling of Adora's fingers running through her hair. Wish I wasn't so sick so I could kiss you. Adora hummed in agreement, carefully plaiting Katra's hair. When the braid was all done, she tied it together with the ribbon. Ta-da! Looks good to me. Katra patted her hair, relieved to have it out of her face. Thanks, Adora, she said softly. You know, I can still kiss you, Adora murmured, wrapping her arms around Catra's waist. It doesn't have to be on the lips. Oh, yeah? Mm. Like this, Adora said, nosing at Catra's neck before kissing up to her jawline. Catra leaned back, rested her head against Adora's shoulder, and closed her eyes. That's nice she admitted, with a smile that she reserved for when she and Adora were alone. I think you're pretty nice, Adora returned. Pulling Adora close, Katra curled up in her arms. She felt her own heartbeat race, and it wasn't thanks to her cold. Adora might have been the only person that thought Katra was nice, but she was also the only one that mattered. Hey, Adora, what's up? I love you. Adora stilled, then looked down at Katra. Her gaze was at once awestruck and thoughtful, and Katra forced herself not to shy away from it. Adora bit her lip, a laugh escaping her. I love you too, Katra. Oh, Katra thought, her heart climbing in her chest. That was the moment Adora leaned in and kissed her, actually kissed her. You, you dumbass, Katra gasped, pulling away with a soft giggle. You're going to get sick. I don't care, Adora declared, kissing her again. Do you love me? Yeah, Katra breathed, 
She pressed her forehead to Adora's, hands cupping her cheeks. I really do. They spent the rest of the weekend in bed, each getting over a cold, but to both of them, it was worth it. Glimmer doesn't know why she thought it would be a good idea to put herself and Katra under a truth spell. But they've been stuck together in one of Horde Prime's holding cells for over a day. Awaiting near certain death, and Glimmer has had enough of Katra's evasive answers to every single question she poses. Call it an impulsive decision, call it manipulative, but if Glimmer is also under the effect of the truth spell, you could also call it a bonding exercise, right? As it turns out, the bonding exercise is not really working. Katra has spent the past 15 minutes tight-lipped, occasionally sticking her tongue out at Glimmer or snarling at her. In the meantime, Glimmer's efforts at coaxing the truth out of Katra have only resulted in a self-incriminating admission that Katra looked hot in her suit at the princess prom that got a cattle out of the feline. No words, though. Look, I thought this would help us get to know each other better. Katra rolls her eyes, then continues staring at the floor. She shivers, curling her tail around her waist in a feeble effort to keep warm. I'm being honest, Glimmer protests. Look, I'm angry at you about so many things, the destruction of Bright Moon, the way you hurt my friends, what happened to my mom. She hugs herself, not looking away from Katra. But I'm willing to work with you, to forgive you even. Slowly, Katra's stare shifts from the ground to Glimmer. You know that neither of us can get out of this place alone. We have to do this together, and if that's going to happen, we need to trust each other. Katra opens her mouth as if to say something, then closes it. You have to tell the truth sometime, Katra. She wavers, tail flicking around in the air. Well, Glimmer leans forward, spit it out. I'm emotionally repressed and struggling to deal with years of trauma that I don't want to acknowledge. Even though I act like I don't care about people, I actually care too much. And my facade of cruelty only pushes them further away. I regret opening the portal and I wish I hadn't sent Entrapta to Beast Island. But I don't know how to accept and atone for my own bad decisions. I wish Scorpio was still my friend. I don't actually hate you and I'm in love with Adora. Glimmer falls back, flawed. You don't hate me? Out of all the things you could focus on, you pick that. Katra shouts, her cheeks reddening slightly. I... I thought it was the easiest thing to tackle. Katra huffs. Well, yeah, nothing about me is easy to tackle. Glimmer purses her lips. She is staring at Katra more intently than ever, trying to follow her gaze as it darts around the holding cell. Katra just dropped a huge bomb on her. A dozen bombs. If she's being honest, which she is, you know, truth spell. If Katra is willing to admit all of that to her, then Glimmer should be able to tell Katra the truth. Right? She should be able to tell herself the truth. I don't think you're alone in that. The fact that we're here, it's my fault. I worked with Shadow Weaver and Light Hope. Horde Prime would never have even found Entrapter if I hadn't tried to activate the heart. I, her voice quivers. I messed up, possibly more than you ever have. Katra arches a brow. And even if you don't think that's true, there's no contest between us anymore. Cautiously, Glimmer holds out a hand to Katra. If we're going to survive, we have to be friends. That earns a small smile from Katra. Gross, she quips. Glimmer sighs. If you aren't willing to do it for me, do it for yourself. Slowly, Katra reaches out and takes Glimmer's hand. She shakes it. Okay, Sparkles, I guess we're doing this. You got enough of that magic left to bust us out of here, or did you waste it all on that truth spell? Glimmer smiles, despite the annoying nickname. She lifts the truth spell, which rises in the air, around them before dissipating into a pink haze. Hey, 
It turns out that a true spell is a lot easier than creating a burst of magic strong enough to break down the door. We'll have to find another way out of here. When the guards come, that's when we make our escape. Then we had better start planning, Glimmer says, before scooting closer to Catra. What are you doing? Catra asks. I just have one more question. You're in love with Adora? Shut up. The rebellion meeting runs late, as usual. It's 10.30 at night and Queen Angela is in the midst of discussing battle formations with Commander Corona. The rest of the attendees have long since ceased paying attention, or at least Princess Glimmer has. Casually, Glimmer glances around the war table. The other commanders have started to let their exhaustion show, and her mother's guards blink back bleary expressions. Across the table, Princess Natasa and Princess Benarella are chatting about their weekly game night. Glimmer yawns under her breath, then turns to her best friend, Bo, with a grin. It seems that my mom no longer cares about my bedtime, she jokes. You have a bedtime? Bo whispers. Obviously not anymore, but it was 8.30 until I turned 13. Bo falls quiet, considering this. I haven't had a bedtime since I was seven, he says eventually. You're an early bird. You wouldn't have needed one anyway. Glimmer cracks her knuckles, then knocks her fists together as if to emphasize the difference between her and Bo. I live for the night. Uh-huh. This is cutting into our board game night, Glimmer mutters. She and Bo have a weekly tradition. Every Friday they play board games together. No matter what else is going on, they find a way to keep the custom going. Sometimes the games are short. Other times they last late into the night. What matters is that they happen at all. It's a promise that Glimmer and Bo would always have time for each other. That they'll be friends forever. Do you think your mom would notice if we snuck out of the room? Probably. And that concludes our meeting for today, Angela calls, her voice rising above the general chatter of the, in the war room. Not that anyone has been paying attention for the past five minutes, she adds. You're all dismissed. Yes, board game time, Glimmer laughs, teleporting around her room. And finally landing on her bed. What should we play? She shouts down at Bo, who is examining the many board games on Glimmer's shelves. What about Seahawks and Ladders? That's too easy. I'm trying to stay awake, not fall asleep. Pick a challenging one, Bo sighs. Risk? It's too close to home. Potatograms? Glimmer snaps her fingers, and sparkles dance around her hand. That's it. Bo yawns into his elbow and tucks the potato-shaped game pouch under one arm, then hops up the floating steps that lead to Glimmer's bed. She watches him lying on her stomach, a curious twinkle in her eye, sometimes now that she and Bo are older. Glimmer wonders if he looks at her differently, as more than a friend, the way she looks at him when no one is around. All right, let's do this, Bo cheers. Glimmer cannot help but smile. It takes about three minutes and seven words, one badly misspelled for Glimmer and Bo to fall asleep. At eleven o'clock, Angela makes her way to Glimmer's room. Her daughter had left her shawl in the war room, draped across the back of her chair. Angela runs the fabric between her fingers, smiling to herself. Her daughter is impulsive. She flirts between being over-enthusiastic and easily bored and she forgets her things everywhere. But she has a good heart, just like her father. Is the underlying thought, the older Glimmer becomes, the more she resembles Angela's late husband, Mika. She wishes he could be here to see how much his daughter has grown. Gently, Angela opens Glimmer's door. Her daughter is sure to still be awake playing a board game with Bo or watching him perform magic tricks. Angela loves that boy. Glimmer? Are you in here, Glimmer? Angela flips her wings once, rising into the air and scans the room, her gaze coming to rest on Glimmer's bed. Oh, she thinks, lips curling into a smile. 
There are glimmer and bow, surrounded by pillows, both snoring softly. Angela doesn't disturb them. She floats down to the ground, heads towards the door, and closes it gently behind her. Unbidden, the memory of her husband, of her and Mika, in the early years of their courtship, drifts through Angela's mind. She couldn't help but notice how Glimmer and Bo had fallen asleep, almost but not quite, in each other's arms.